Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to you as we gather together once again to worship God. As we get underway, let me just share a, a few announcements for the week ahead and for today as well. Uh, this morning, we're continuing our sermon series in the book of Judges. We're in Judges chapter 11, and perhaps one of the more difficult uh, passages we come to this morning uh, as we look at Jephthah's vow. Uh, then we'll uh, gather again this evening for our service at six o'clock. Uh, we have a, a visiting speaker, Andrew Kerr, who some of you will know is coming to take the evening service here at six whilst I'm away taking the service over in Groomsport. Then in the, the week ahead, just a, a few things for me to mention uh, today. Uh, the Ladies Bible Study meets on Tuesday morning this week. You'll find the study sheets for that available on the desk as you head out uh, this morning. On Wednesday evening is our prayer gathering as usual at uh, half past seven. We'll continue our, our series looking at the doctrine of man. Um, on Thursday morning is mums and toddlers, half past ten. And then next weekend is, of course, our church weekend away, which we're very much looking forward to. Uh, Slight change to the plans. Uh, the speaker who was flying over from England for that, uh, he and his wife and at least one of their children have uh, just come down with COVID, unfortunately. So we've had to cancel that speaker. Um, but uh, we very kindly have uh, been glad to uh, arrange another speaker, Lee Campbell, who some of you will know. He's preached here in the past. Uh, he's a good friend of ours and uh, he's available next weekend and so he's going to come and join us for that weekend uh, we'll be looking at the book of jonah together and uh, we look forward to that time together i know there are some details uh, that some of you will be wanting about what to bring and whatever i'll pass on those details in, in due course and um, we've got 30 people signed up so we're delighted with the, the response there are still uh, spaces if you want to come along and haven't yet signed up uh, there is a chance to to do so uh, so that's next weekend. Um, there will be a morning service here as usual. Colin Moore is going to take that service. Uh, it'll obviously be a smaller gathering than normal, but there will still be a, a service here. The doors will still be open uh, for that. And the evening service is unaffected. I'll be taking the evening service here at six o'clock. Let me just mention as well the shoe boxes. Today's the deadline for the, the shoe boxes. So thank you to those who have returned them already. And uh, please get them, them in today if you've not done so yet. Well, today is, of course, uh, Remembrance Sunday. I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 46 uh, as we begin our time of worship together. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, as we read those words, we're reminded, of course, God is the one who is able to make wars cease, even to the ends of the earth. And today being Remembrance Sunday, we're remembering those who have given their lives in the conflicts of both the past and the present and have done so in order to secure and sustain the level of peace that we're able to enjoy today. We're thankful for those sacrifices that they have made 
and we look to God to be the one who comforts those who mourn. And as Christian people, we look ahead to the day when all wars will finally cease, the fulfillment of those words from Psalm 46, when Christ returns and he will establish peace forevermore. So we're going to observe a time of silence now, prayerfully reflecting on these things. Would you please stand for a minute's silence? Our Father, we thank you that you're the one who is able to bring perfect and lasting peace to the world. And we thank you that one day that will be true when Jesus returns. And as we wait for that day, we know that as Jesus has said, there will continue to be wars and rumours of wars. And so in light of that, we do thank you for the level of peace that we enjoy today. We thank you for those who have made sacrifices to bring that about, those who have given their lives in past conflicts. Father, we pray for those today who are serving in a military capacity in this country and also in other parts of the world. And we pray that they would work to preserve and to establish and to maintain peace. We pray for the families of those who have lost their lives through warfare and those for whom today is a day when those memories of loved ones are especially at the forefront of their minds and we pray that you would be a very present help to them in their mourning father we pray most of all that the day would soon come when the lord jesus the prince of peace will return and all warfare will cease and his kingdom of peace will be fully established father we ask all these things in his strong and precious name Amen. Well, please remain standing as we sing our first item of praise this morning. It's Psalm 130. Uh, this wonderful psalm about our God of grace. Lord, from the depths I call to you. Lord, hear me from on high and give attention to my voice when I for mercy cry. Psalm 130.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that this morning we can gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we can bring our worship to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, and in the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for those words that we've been able to sing to you this morning from Psalm 130, which reminds us that you are a God of such grace. And as the psalmist writes, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Father, we know that we've fallen short. We know that we deserve your condemnation for our sin. And yet our confidence is not in ourselves, but in Jesus, who has paid for all our sin once and for all at the cross. And in him, we are assured of acceptance with you. And so we can say with this psalmist, with the Lord there is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem his people from all his sins. Our Father, we acknowledge our many sins which we've committed by thought and word and deed against you, provoking justly your wrath and indignation against us. And we do earnestly repent and we're truly sorry for our wrongdoings. We're grieved when we remember them. And so have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past. And grant that from now on we may serve and please you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name. And we pray that this morning, as we gather to worship you, that you would be present with us by the Spirit of Christ, working in our hearts, empowering us to give glory to you in all that we do this morning, all that we do as well in the coming week. And we bring all of our needs to you. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for Stephen in his ongoing treatment. We pray on that that treatment would be effective to heal and restore his body. Pour out your blessing upon him and his household, we pray. We pray for those who are grieving at this time. We think of the friends and family of Martha Price especially. We thank you for that funeral service that took place here on Thursday. And for all of those who are in attendance, we pray that in Christ, they would find comfort and hope. And we pray for others as well, facing times of struggle and difficulty. We pray that they would know your help. We pray that they would know and be reminded that you are their portion and you are the strength of their hearts. And so grant comfort and peace, we pray. And we pray for those without Christ. Lord, we long to see the church built up as you add to us those who are being saved. Bring many to Christ, we pray. Because we ask it all in his name and for your glory's sake. Amen. We hear these words of encouragement now from 1 Peter chapter 2, referring to the, the words of Isaiah 53 and assuring us of forgiveness through what Christ has done for us on the cross. Peter writes, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So let's sing together of Christ and all that he has done for us, primarily in his death on the cross on our behalf. Hymn number 214, we sing the praise of him who died, of him who died upon the cross. The sinner's hope lets men deride, for this we count the world but loss. Hymn number 214, we'll stand and sing.
please take a seat. Please could you turn with me to the book of Judges and chapter 11 as we continue the story of Jephthah. We're at verse 29 so far in this uh, chapter. We read as follows. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them and the Lord gave them into his hand and he struck them from Arawah to the neighbourhood of Meneath, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, Keramim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dancers. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity. I and my companions. So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite for four days in the year. Well, this is the word of God. We thank God for it and pray for his blessing as we consider these very difficult verses together this morning. I'm going to speak to the boys and girls uh, for a a few minutes now. It's great to have you with us, guys, for our our service this morning. And I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I just want you to think about it for a few moments. And the, the question is this. What is the most powerful and the most dangerous thing that you own? probably best if you don't answer that question out loud, isn't it? What is the most powerful and the most dangerous thing that you own? What do you think that might be? Now, you might be surprised that what the Bible says in answer to that question is this. The Bible says the most powerful and the most dangerous thing that you own is your tongue. I wonder if any of you are thinking that. I guess probably not. And in James chapter 3, James explains why that's the case. And he uses a number of different pictures, pictures for the tongue 
to help us understand why it is the most dangerous and the most powerful thing that we own. So we're going to think about a couple of those pictures this morning. Uh, the first thing he says is that the tongue is a little bit like a, a small fire. Now I've got some matches here, so we're going to hopefully see a, a small fire. Hopefully it will stay small. Uh, so here we go. Here's a, here's a match burning, just a, a very, very small fire. And uh, of course it doesn't look like very much, does it? It doesn't look very powerful, it doesn't look very dangerous. But of course, even with just a, a small flame like that, it's possible to set fire to a whole forest and destroy the whole thing. So I better blow this out before anything worse happens. Just a small fire can set fire to a huge forest and destroy the whole thing. So the Bible says that our tongues are like that. They're, they're small, they don't look like very much, do they? But with our tongues, we can say things that really hurt other people. We can say nasty things. We can say things that really damage other people, do great damage in our lives and in their lives as well. And then there's another picture that James uses to describe our tongues. And he says that our tongues are like wild animals. Now imagine having a wild animal as a pet. Imagine a, a lion or something like that. We've got a cat and she's hard enough to control, but imagine trying to control a lion. Absolutely impossible for you to bring it under control. And James says words are like that. We can't control the things we say. We try to control the things we say and all of a sudden an angry word comes out or a nasty word or an untruthful word, or a silly word, or a, a bad word, or a foolish word. Try as we might, we can't control our tongue. It's like a wild animal. That's why the Bible says, your tongue is the most powerful and the most dangerous thing that you own. And in the story from the Bible that we're looking at together this morning, we meet a man called Jephthah, who is known for his words. And he said something in this story that was very, very foolish and caused a great deal of damage to him and to his family and to other people as well. And I wonder, have you ever said something that you really regretted? And yet it was too late. The damage was already done. Now we've all done that, haven't we? And so what do we need? Well, the answer is we need Jesus. Because only he can forgive us for the things that we've said. Those nasty things and hurtful things we've said to other people. Jesus can forgive us. But as well as that, he's the one who can bring our tongue under control. So that our tongues are used in a way that please him. So we're going to pray for those things now. Thank you for listening, boys and girls. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we've been thinking about how our tongues are so powerful and so dangerous. They can cause so much damage when we say foolish things and nasty things. And try as we might, we can't control our tongues. Those nasty and unpleasant words just come out. And we've all done it. We've all spoken foolish or nasty things. And we thank you that even though we can't control our tongues ourselves, you're the one who can forgive us for these things and bring our tongues under control. And so we pray, Jesus, you'd forgive us for every wrong thing that we've said. And we pray that you'd change us so that our words in the future will be true and kind and bring blessing to others. And in your name, we pray these things. Amen. Before we come back to that passage from Judges 11, we're going to sing together once again. It's number 25 in the songbook, or you can follow on the screen. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. We'll stand and sing.
Please be seated. Let's pray together now. Father, we thank you for your word to us. And as we turn this morning to a very challenging portion of scripture, we ask for your help for me and for all of us as we grapple with what you have to say to us today. Lord, help us to receive your word and respond to it rightly and to offer you the worship that is rightly yours because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do keep your Bible open there at those verses that we read earlier on. We're in Judges chapter 11 and verses 29 through 40. And in our sermon last week, you remember we were looking at verses 12 to 28, the previous section. And we spent our time last week considering in detail the words of Jephthah. We called it Jephthah's Guide to Apologetics. And we called it that because in those verses, Jephthah shows us a great example of how to speak to others about our faith. We saw, didn't we, when faced with hostility, Jephthah spoke peaceably. When he was faced with lies, he spoke truthfully. When he was faced with unbelief, he spoke, he spoke faithfully. And this week, once again, we're going to focus on the words of Jephthah. Only this time, it is very, very different. Because Jephthah gives an example now of how not to speak. And we come to this story that Jephthah is perhaps best known for. And that is the story of his vow and the tragic events that followed it. Well, we'll come to those words of Jephthah a little bit later on. But we, before we get there, there are a couple of other things that the writer wants us to take notice of first. And so to start with, notice this. The Spirit of God empowered the Saviour. The Spirit of God empowered the Saviour. So let's recap where we've got to so far in this story of Jephthah. The Ammonite army has invaded the territory belonging to the tribe of Gilead. The Gileadites are in great distress as they face this terrifying enemy. They need a, a leader. They need someone to save them. They need someone who's going to come and lead them against the enemy, defeat the enemy, give them rest. God's people need a savior. And they choose and they appoint this very unlikely character called Jephthah to be their leader, to be their saviour in this situation. And as we saw last week, Jephthah's first action as leader was to try and avoid conflict with the Ammonites. He spoke peaceably. He spoke truthfully. He spoke faithfully to them. He negotiated with the Ammonites, trying to reason with them. He told them about this God of his that they were going up against when they attacked his people. But the Ammonite king simply ignored everything that Jephthah said to him. And so those negotiations all collapsed. And the tribe of Gilead is now heading for a battle against the Ammonites. Jephthah is going to lead them into this battle. And yet notice what happens first of all there in verse 29. We're told, then the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah. This is something that we've already seen a few times previously in the book of Judges. When God raised up these judges 
as the saviour figures for his people in these times of crisis. He did not leave the, the saviours to do it in their own strength. No, the Spirit of God empowered the saviour. We saw that, didn't we, with the very first judge mentioned in the book, a man called Othniel. Chapter 3, verse 10, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. Then we saw it again explicitly with Gideon. Chapter 6, verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abias rites were called out to follow him. And now again, the same thing happens with Jephthah. Once again, we're told the Spirit of God empowered the Saviour. And of course, all of this is pointing us forward beyond these little saviours to Jesus, the ultimate saviour for God's people. The saviour who was empowered for his work by the Holy Spirit who rested upon him. And so in the book of Isaiah, the Lord speaks about the promised Messiah, the promised Saviour. He says this of him, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. And then fast forward about 700 years from Isaiah, and we come to the baptism of Jesus. And we see that prophecy from the book of Isaiah fulfilled visibly. When Jesus also had been baptised and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Here we see the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven, anointing Jesus with power for his work as Saviour. John writes that Jesus received the Spirit without measure. And in fact, everything Jesus did throughout his whole life on earth, he did by depending on that strength that was given to him by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, his constant companion. In the power of the Spirit, Jesus was conceived. In the power of the Spirit, he grew and was filled with wisdom. In the power of the Spirit, he was able to say no to every temptation. In the power of the Spirit, he was able to obey the law of God perfectly. In the power of the Spirit, he performed miracles. Then in the power of the Spirit, he offered himself up on the cross. Three days later, in the power of the Spirit, he was raised from the dead. At every point of his whole career as Saviour. The Spirit of God empowered Jesus as the Saviour. And you see, don't you, here in this unlikely character of Jephthah, we have just a glimpse, just a little foretaste of the Spirit of God empowering the Saviour. What happens in this small way in Jephthah's life, empowering him for that battle, is then writ large in the life of Jesus, the Saviour empowered by the Holy Spirit for all his work as Saviour. And then as well as that, notice the sovereignty of God guaranteed the victory. So the Spirit of God empowered the Saviour, and the sovereignty of God guaranteed the victory. So look down at verse 32 now, and, and notice what we're told there. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Arawer to the neighbourhood of Minnith, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Keramim with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Jephthah and his army completely rout the Ammonites. We're not told how big these two armies were in comparison to one another, but we are told of just how comprehensive this victory was. He struck them with a great blow, we're told, conquering no fewer than 20 Ammonite cities along the way. This is a stunning victory. And it was all down to God. 
The text makes that clear. It was the Lord who gave the Ammonites into Jephthah's hand. The victory was of the Lord. The sovereignty of God guaranteed the victory. And again, it's just a small preview in advance, isn't it, of Christ's ultimate victory over the enemy. At the cross, that's where we see the sovereign power of God at work to defeat the enemy. At the cross, the sovereign God routed the enemy. As Paul writes, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. And at Christ's return, we will see the the final consummation of that victory accomplished at Calvary. So notice these two things that the writer flags up for us in the early verses of the story. Don't overlook them by just rushing ahead to the bit about Jephthah's vow. See, first of all, the the Spirit of God empowered the Saviour. And the sovereignty of God guaranteed the victory. And see how these things point us forward to that ultimate Saviour who is Jesus. And the ultimate victory on our behalf at the cross. Well, so far, so good. But then we also have to deal with the main thing going on in this bit of the story, and that is Jephthah's vow. The writer tells us that whilst Jephthah was on his way to the battle against the Ammonites, he entered into this vow before God. So verses 30 and 31. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Now the vow itself is simple to understand. If God gives him victory over the Ammonites, then when Jephthah returns home after the battle, Whatever comes out of his house, first of all, to meet him, he or she or it, is going to be offered up to God as a burnt offering. And it all comes back to haunt Jephthah later on. After the battle, when the Lord had given him the victory over the Ammonites, Jephthah then goes back to his house in a place called Mizpah. You can perhaps imagine him on his way home and he gets to his driveway to his house and he's walking up the long driveway and just at that very moment his daughter looks out of the window she sees her dad walking up the driveway and he's a hero now remember for most of his life Jephthah had been despised and rejected and it's all changed now he's coming home as a hero He's just led his people to a great victory over the the Ammonites. And God's people can rejoice. Their enemies are defeated. They're at peace. They can enjoy peace once again. They are at rest thanks to the victory of this saviour. And so this girl, we don't know how old she was, but she wants to give her dad a hero's welcome. And... She quickly grabs some tambourines off the the shelf in the house. And she goes out the front door dancing. She's greeting her father joyfully. She's celebrating his victory. Well, the front door opens and Jephthah sees his daughter come out. And his heart sinks in that instant. And I guess he was hoping that the first person to come out of the door might have been one of his servants, one of his slaves. He would have been okay with sacrificing a slave. Or maybe he was thinking of a, an animal of some sort, perhaps a, a little calf or a lamb wandering around in the, in the courtyard, perhaps of the house, and then leaving the doors of that courtyard. Maybe that's the kind of thing Jephthah was hoping for. Maybe that's the kind of thing he, he had in mind when he was making the vow. But, but not his daughter. This is... His only child. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. 
Well, the daughter, for her part, figures out what is going on. She understands that her father must have made a, a vow to, to sacrifice something to God. And she realises that she's going to be this sacrifice. And strangely and surprisingly, she goes along with it. And she says, my father, you've opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies on the Ammonites. She accepts this is what is going to happen. But then she says this. Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone for two months. That I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity. I and my companions. She asks that the sacrifice be delayed for two months. During which time she can go away with her friends. She can grieve for herself, grieving for the fact that she must die at this young age, never have the possibility of being married, never the chance to have children. Well, Jephthah grants her these two months. I suppose you could say it's the least he could do, isn't it? And she, she goes off into the mountains with her friends and they weep alongside her for these next two months. And they lament what is going to happen. And then we read this. At the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. This girl is slaughtered. And she is then offered up to God as a burnt offering. It is a, a tragic and awful and sickening series of events. And it's so awful and so tragic that we're told it then became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel, the women of Israel, would year by year lament the daughter of Jephthah for four days each year. Appropriately enough, today is Remembrance Sunday. It's the Sunday in the year when we pause to remember those who have died in conflict. And for a while at least, the women of Israel would hold a, a four-day act of remembrance each year and they would remember this tragedy of Jephthah's daughter. But what on earth do you, do you make of, of a story like that? I have to say it is one of the darkest episodes in the book of Judges. And at that, one of the darkest episodes in the whole of the Bible as well. What do you do with the story of Jephthah and this tragic vow and the events that followed it? It's not an easy passage to handle as you can imagine. And it leaves us scratching our heads with what to do with it. And yet there are important things we can learn from this very sorry tale. And I want to finish with two such applications from this story that hopefully we will find helpful this morning. And the first is this, that what you believe about God shapes the way you relate to God. What you believe about God shapes the way you relate to God. Let me try and unpack that from the, the story. Look at the story from this point of view. Ask the question, what made Jephthah make this foolish vow? Why did he say what he did when he made the vow? Let's dig underneath the vow itself and, and look what's going on on the inside. What's going on in Jephthah's heart and mind? as he says these words. Why does he say these words? And when you look at the story from that angle, it's very obvious, isn't it, that underneath everything else, here's the main issue in the story, that Jephthah has some wrong beliefs about who God is. Now, to be fair to him, last week, we saw Jephthah speaking wonderful truths about God. He spoke faithfully, as we saw, telling of what the Lord has done for his people, warning about God's coming judgment. And so, in all fairness, Jephthah's view of God was not completely wrong. He was a true believer, remember. We must remember that. And yet, what, what we see here in this episode of his life is that somewhere along the lines, his beliefs about who his God is have become warped and skewed and stained by the kind of pagan ideas that were commonplace 
in those days and in that region. Remember, the Israelites were, were surrounded by pagan people who worshipped idols. And they thought of these idols as little deities whose blessings could be coerced if you paid them well enough with plenty of sacrifices. And the more you sacrificed to them, the better life would be for you, the better the gods would bless you. And so these idols could be manipulated. You could get out of them the blessings you wanted. If you gave some of your crops to them, they would bless you for that. If you went one better and sacrificed one of your animals, well, they would bless you more. And better still, if you sacrificed a human to them, all the better. How could the gods not give you lots of blessings if you'd sacrificed even a human being to them? This is the kind of things that the Canaanites, the people surrounding the Israelites, used to do. This is the kind of thing the Ammonites used to do. And it's clear, isn't it, these pagan ideas have started to influence the way in which Jephthah thinks about his God. And you see, here's the, the irony in the story that he's about to fight against the Ammonites, but at this point, he's thinking like an Ammonite. He is thinking as an Ammonite here. He's facing this big crisis in his life. He's got to go into battle against the Ammonite army. He's terrified of them. And he's thinking to himself, what do I need to do here to get me through? And as we've seen, he's already been given the Holy Spirit. God has given him all that he needs already, but Jephthah thinks to himself, no, I'm going to need more than the Holy Spirit here to get me through. And, and this idea comes to him. He thinks to himself, well, these pagan people that surround us, they say if you pay the gods with plenty of sacrifices, they'll give you what you want. They'll make your life easy. And so how about I offer my God some sacrifice on the condition that he will let us win this battle? Quid pro quo. I'll strike a deal with my God. I get the victory. He gets the sacrifice. And we can both be happy. Win, win. And so he says to God, here's the deal, God. You give me the victory. And I promise that I will give you whatever sacrifice you want. I'll even sacrifice a human if that's what it takes. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And then later on when he realises that this vow means he's going to sacrifice his daughter, he doesn't go back on the vow. He could have gone back on the vow. He could have repented of it. He should have repented of it. And yet he's still thinking that God is like one of those inflexible pagan gods who will demand this sacrifice as payment for a victory already granted. And when you, you dig underneath the vow, you see what is going on in Jephthah's heart and mind, don't you? He's thinking about God in these pagan categories. He's thinking like an Ammonite. He's thinking that in order to get God's blessings, you need to pay God off with sacrifices. And you see, that is the real issue here, underneath everything else that is going on. What you believe about God will shape the way that you relate to God. Now, what does all of that mean for us as God's people today? You're not Jephthah. This is a very extreme example that we're looking at in Judges 11. I don't suppose any of us are, are considering sacrificing someone as a, an offering to God to try and get God's blessings out of him. And yet I hope you see this is the point of application for us. Ask yourself this question, where are my beliefs about who God is being skewed and tainted by non-Christian ideas? Or to put it more pointedly still, have I started to think about God and my relationship to God just a little bit like Jephthah did in this story? Just a little bit. And so perhaps subconsciously you, you started to relate to God a bit like this. You, you say to him, perhaps silently in your prayers, God, here's the deal. 
If I do X, Y, or Z for you, you have to bless me. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Or God, if you sort out my problems in life, then I'll be a good person for you. I'll pay you back with a good life, a religious life. Win-win. We're both happy. Now, it's a less extreme example, isn't it? But you see, in essence, it is the mindset of Jephthah here, thinking like an Ammonite. And what had Jephthah forgotten about his God? He'd forgotten that this God is a God of grace. He's not like the pagan idols. And we can never pay him for any blessing because he doesn't need anything from us anyway. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And whatever we do for him, we are still unworthy servants, fallen sinners, finite creatures. Of course you can never pay God off with your sacrifices. Of course you can never place him in debt to you by trying to do stuff for him. And what is more, you don't need to do that because he is a God of grace. He's a God who pours out upon his people every blessing in Christ Jesus. And so understand this, every blessing you will ever receive from God, both now and in eternity, has already been paid for in full by Jesus. And God gives those blessings to you freely, generously, and by sheer unmerited grace. And when that thought captivates your heart, that our God is a God of abundant grace, that will transform the way which you relate to our God. And you stop coming to him like Jephthah did in this story, foolishly trying to offer him this, that or the other, to try and win his favour and get some of his blessings out of him. No, you come to him admitting you're not good enough. And you have nothing that you can pay him with, nothing in your hand you bring. Simply to the cross you cling. You rest only in the grace that he offers to us in Jesus. And you see the point that underlines this story. What you believe about God will shape the way you relate to God. Let me ask you, what do you believe about who God is? How are you trying to relate to him? See who God really is. He is the God of grace. And so relate to him by resting in the grace given to us in Christ. And then finally, the story tells us this. Look for a true and better sacrifice. Look for a true and better sacrifice. What does this story remind you of? It should remind you in some ways of the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. A, a father promising to offer his child in sacrifice. And not just his child, but at that his only child. The Hebrew word that is used to describe Jephthah's daughter as an only child is the same word that is used to describe Isaac as an only child in Genesis 22. And then the way in which Jephthah's daughter submits to her father, though he was wrong, mirrors the way in which Isaac submits to Abraham in Genesis 22. The difference, of course, is that in Genesis 22, it was God's word that directed the proceedings. Whereas in Judges 11, it is Jephthah's foolish words that direct the proceedings. I wonder if you noticed in the whole story, God says not a single word. This is not what God intended. And at the end of Genesis 22, Isaac's life is saved by God. But here in Judges 11, there's no happy ending. The daughter's life is lost, ended by her father. And so this whole episode is like a, a grotesque parody of Genesis 22. It is a, a sickening story. It ought to sicken us. And it should leave us longing for a true and better sacrifice than this. An only begotten son, submitting to his father's will, 
his life offered up in sacrifice before God and in a way that is fully pleasing to God. That's where we end, isn't it? For all the mess of Judges 11, look beyond what happens here and look to the true and better sacrifice that has been offered by Jesus for us. That he was sacrificed, put to death in our place to save us from the death that we deserve. His is the true and better sacrifice. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, this is a, a truly horrible story of a young woman needlessly put to death because of her father's foolishness. It is a, a tragedy. But we pray that you would help us to learn what you intend to teach us through this story. Help us to have a right view of who you are. Help us not to think like Jephthah did in this episode, thinking that we need to try and pay you for blessings, as if you're like a, a pagan idol. And help us rather to understand that you are a God of sheer grace, who gives freely to his children, and that every blessing we will ever experience, now and forever, has been paid for already by Jesus, thanks to his life and death and resurrection. And so may we simply rest in your grace, that grace shown to us in Jesus. And as we look at this unpleasant story of a sinful sacrifice, help us to look beyond it and see that a true and better sacrifice has been offered that brings us to you. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you gave your only son. Thank you that he submitted perfectly to your will for him. Thank you that you poured out your spirit upon him to empower him for all his work as saviour. Thank you that in the Holy Spirit, he then offered himself up in our place at the cross. Thank you that in him we're forgiven, and we're cleansed, and we're reconciled to you forever. And so nothing in our hands we bring, simply to his cross we cling. We rest in him alone, and the wonderful grace that is ours in him. In his name, we pray these things. Amen. We we'll close by singing hymn number 496. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin. The double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. We'll stand and sing.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.